Amen. Well, guys, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me for our scripture reading for our sermon text this morning. Today we're going to be together in the book of Acts, chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and we're going to read together verse 5 to verse 20. Acts 4, 5 to 20, I'll ask if you'll please stand with me for the reading of Holy Scripture. Acts 4, 5 through 20, this is God's holy word for us, his people. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified... Whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a noble sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. These are the words of God. Let's ask Him to bless our time in His word. Father, we do ask that you would bless not only this reading of your word, which in itself is powerful, but that you would bless now my small, measly efforts to unpack what you've said, to explain it and apply it, that you would bless this preaching and make it come alive with the power of the name of Jesus. For me, the one who speaks, and for all who hear, write your truth upon all our hearts. You be our teacher, and you get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, names carry much more weight and significance than they do today. When parents are picking out names for their children, they usually choose names that just sound nice or sound good or sound unique. They don't usually give too much thought to what the names might mean. Um, When I was in high school in English class, one of my two English, either it was either first, it was either freshman year or senior year, I don't remember. I remember the teacher, but I had her twice in two different grades, so I don't know what grade it was. But in one of her classes, Miss Hearn, if you're watching, (laughs) 
She's not. <laughs> I don't think she liked me. Um, <laughs> in high school English class, in one of Miss Hearn's classes, she gave us an assignment. We had to research our names. Where did they come from? What do they mean? How did you know? How did you get this name? And uh, I don't re- I don't remember almost anybody else's. Um, in the class, except um, there was one guy in there whose name was Andrew Mann. Andrew Mann. And in Greek, Andrew means manly. So he was manly man. (laughs) Which I thought, you know, sounded good. I wanted that name. My name doesn't mean manly man. Um, If I remember correctly, Wesley means something like West wind of the meadow. <laughs> the western meadow. Some, like some hippie. Like I'm some hippie out in a meadow. West wind. And then you throw in my last name, Grub. <laughs> and I'm like the west meadow worm. That's, <laughs> that's it. Sounds like a bad minor league baseball team. <laughs> The West Meadow Worms in last place again this year. <laughs> right? So my mom didn't give any thought to what my name meant. She, did, she just thought it sounded... I think it sounds nice. I can't say it in public, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago. But uh, it's, it doesn't... It, you know, it's not an impressive meaning. Uh, but thankfully, it, it, names don't really mean that much today in terms of what they meant. In terms of where they come from. But back in the Bible, especially the Old Testament... Names really mattered. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean every single name super, super mattered, but there are a few times in the Old Testament where the name of a person is so important it gets changed because of a special assignment that God has for that person. In the Bible, a name often carries tremendous significance, both for the present and for the future. In the Bible, your name is your destiny. Just think of a couple of examples. Eve, in the Garden of Eden, we're told she's given a name. She's given the name Eve because it sounds like the Hebrew word for life. And she's named life because, the Bible says, she is the mother of all living human beings. So she's named life. She's the mother of life. Or take Abram later in Genesis. His name, Abram, means in Hebrew, exalted father. But when God makes a covenant with Abraham and he says, you are going to be the father of a multitude of nations, his name gets changed from Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, which does mean, Genesis says, father of a multitude. And why? Because that's his destiny. You are now going to be the father of all these nations, and in you, all these nations will find God's blessing. One more example in Genesis is Jacob. Jacob means supplanter. Right? He's the one who takes Esau's birthright. Even though Jacob is Esau's twin, he's born after Esau. Esau comes out first, and the Bible says... Jacob is grabbing Esau's heel when they're born, which was a sign that this is what their relationship is going to be. Jacob is going to be snatching at the heel of his firstborn, uh, of his older brother, Isaac's firstborn. And so his name means supplanter, and he ends up taking Esau's birthright, but then later his name gets changed to Israel, which means wrestles with God. Because if you remember the story, he wrestles an angel, and he says, tell me your name. He won't tell him his name. And he says, all right, let me go. The match is over. And Jacob says, I will not let you go till you bless me. And so he blesses him with a limp. He socks him in the leg, and he walks with a limp. And then he says, you know what? You've wrestled with God tonight, and you've prevailed. And so your name will reflect that. You will be... Israel, And, of course, now that's the nation of Israel's destiny. Because what the whole rest of the Old Testament is about is Israel wrestling with God. Not obeying God, wrestling with God. And so, destiny is tied to a name. 
character, who you are, is tied to a name very often in the Bible. Your name in the Bible captures who you are, what you will do, who you'll be, what you'll become, what legacy you'll leave behind. Your, your name is your character. Your name is your destiny. In our passage this morning, I want us to consider the name of Jesus. By thinking about his name, let us see his character, his destiny that he shares with us, who he is for us. Let us see through his name, his glory, the wonder of who he is, the wonder of what he's done for you, and let us see the only fitting response that his name deserves. That's where we're going today. Let's turn to our text in the book of Acts, chapter 4. For context, Peter and John, in chapter 3, have healed a crippled man. And the crowds are amazed. And now they want to listen to what they have to say. And so, they begin preaching a lengthy sermon, which takes up the rest of chapter 3 of Acts. They preach to the people throughout the rest of the chapter, and then the authorities arrest them, and they spend the night in custody. This is in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. It says, And as they, this is Peter and John, the two disciples of Jesus, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they're out there preaching the gospel after they perform this miracle. And of course, the temple authorities and the cops who guard the temple, they're all ticked off. They're very annoyed by this. And you got to think, this is not that long after the crucifixion of Jesus. So, I mean, they just got rid of this guy, they think, and here come their disciples, and they're like, oh my gosh, it's, we're still having to deal with this. It was very annoying, the, it says. And then in verse 3 it says, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So 2,000 on Pentecost, and by the time we get to chapter 4, verse 4, it's 5,000. So the word is spreading, conversions are happening. And this is where we pick up our text that we read earlier in verses 5 through 7. Let's look at 5 to 7. On the next day, so they've been in custody all night, now it's time for the trial, the next morning. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, who was the high priest before, who condemned Jesus, and John and Alexander, relatives of Annas and Caiaphas, and all who were of the high priestly family. The family that ran the temple and ran Jerusalem and was in charge was this one family. This one family. Talk about nepotism. It was just, it was almost passed down. The high priesthood was passed down like it was a royal throne or something. So there's this one guy and all his sons and their sons, they all get their turn working as the high priest, working as the chief priests, and they are very cozy with the Romans and with Pontius Pilate who condemned Jesus. And this is part of why this family, they work so well with the Romans, why would the Romans get rid of them? So this is who Peter and John are dealing with. Now we get to verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, so they called Peter and John, they're standing there, the whole high priest family's there, all these elders. I mean, this is very, very intimidating. They're by themselves. You don't get a right to a lawyer. I mean, there's no j impartial jury. This is not looking good. This is how they condemned and killed Jesus. So this is not a, this is not a low pressure situation. This is a very risky situation. Their lives are literally on the line. And when they had set them in the midst, in verse 7, they inquired. This is the, the authorities asking Peter and John, By what power or by what name 
did you do this, perform this miracle by healing this crippled man? By what power or by what name? Notice what they're asking in verse 7. Name and power are almost used interchangeably in the verse. By what name or power have you done this? You see how they're associating name and power together. Because in this particular ancient culture, not just in Israel, but in the general Greco-Roman culture, the name of a healer or the name of a wonder worker is almost like magic. You can use names and in incantations, and you can find archaeological remains, artifacts, where there are these sort of magical incantations and spells where they're invoking the different names of different healers or gods or goddesses or spirits or you name it, and they're either trying to get healing for themselves or put a hex on their enemies. So-and-so cheated me out of my taxes. Get him, so-and-so. And they say the magic words, and they hope that this will have the God or whatever put a hex on somebody. So it's almost like magic. If you can invoke the name, if you can get control of the name, you can control the power. Because the name and the power are connected. They're associated. The name is like a channel that conveys the power. And the greater the work or miracle, the greater the power. And the greater the power, the greater the name. The name carries the power. The name carries the authority. Invoking the name invokes the greatness of the name and the greatness of the one who has that name. Peter's response points to the supreme greatness of the name that he and John invoke. Peter proclaims that no other name is greater. And that's the first point we need to see today about the name of Jesus. No other name is greater. Look at verses 8 to 10. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. And man, in this situation, you better be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need supernatural boldness to stand where he's standing and open his mouth and say the things he's about to say. And Jesus told them in the Gospels that when people drag you in front of courts and kings to put you to death and punish you for speaking in my name, don't worry about what you're going to say in that moment. The Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. Just trust me to come through. And no matter what the outcome is, my power will be on display and my name will be glorified and my purposes will be fulfilled and my kingdom will go forward and you'll have your role to play, but trust me, I'm bigger than this situation and I've got some things under control. And that's what, Peter, it's time to do it. It's one thing to learn that in the classroom. Now it's time to do it. And he does it. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them in verse 8, rulers of the people and elders... If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to you all. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Boldness indeed from the apostle Peter. Great boldness to tell them to their face, you crucified the one that healed this guy. So he's condemning them instead of them condemning him. It's almost like he put them on trial and is telling them what crimes they're guilty of. Tremendous boldness. What a witness. Now, if we look back, Peter has already said these things in the sermon he got arrested for preaching back in chapter 3. Look back in 3, to verse, uh, starting in verse 11. All right, they heal this guy, and in, in talking about this guy in verse 11, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon. So they're in the temple. 
And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob... The God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. That's Barabbas. And you killed the author of life. What a sermon. You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead to this we are witnesses. And this name, his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of all. The power of the name through faith in that name, that has what has brought about this miraculous deed. This great and mighty name that we invoked. The power doesn't come from our name or who we are or our holiness of heart or our piety or good deeds. It comes strictly through the author of life who was crucified for sin but raised from the dead, glorified by the Father and seated at his right hand. And guys, that's the key to this whole first point. Why does he have the greatest name? Why is there no other name that is greater? It's the, the key is in the resurrection. Jesus' exaltation, that God has raised him up and seated him at the right hand. Paul makes this point perfectly in Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says, And being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, Philippians 2, 9, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God has given him the name. He has exalted that precious name to the highest heaven, higher than any other thing could ever be exalted, to be at God's own right hand. This is where Jesus is, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death in obedience to the Father and has been raised up. Jesus says after his resurrection in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth, that's mine. <laughs> it's his. It's been given to him. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. He has power and authority over all things. He is Lord of all things. And therefore, Christian, because of the greatness of his name, you can call upon his name in all things and at all times. If he's Lord of all, then you can call upon him in all ways and in all times and in all circumstances. Because he's Lord of those times, he's Lord of those things, and he's Lord of those circumstances. They're not, they, didn't, they, they might have snuck up on you. You may not have been prepared for what you're going through, but they didn't sneak up on him. He is Lord of all things, and therefore, you can call upon him. You can invoke that same name in all things. And what a motive this is for faith to trust in Jesus, to trust in his powerful name. Because when you trust in his name, you're trusting in him, the one who has the name and has the power and can use it. When you invoke that name and call upon that name, you invoke the power. You invoke the power that Jesus has. This is a motive for trust and faith. Oh, what a motive this is for prayer. 
to pray in the name of Jesus, that's not just like some cliche Christian thing we tack on at the end of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. In your name, amen. In his name, amen. We just, I mean, maybe it's just a habit. We just kind of get used to it. We don't even know why we're doing it. It's because that's the greatest name you can invoke. You're not praying in your name. God forgive me in my name. Amen. God help me in my name. Amen. No. Our names don't mean anything. His name is the greatest name. God has given him the name above all names. He's given him the power above all powers, the authority above all authorities, and he is the one in whose name we go before the Father on the basis of who he is and what he's accomplished for us and where God has put him at his right hand, we can call upon him and we can pray in his name and invoke his power. I remember at summer camp one year, we were talking about prayer. It was youth camp, we're talking about prayer. And I remember, the, and, I, and maybe I've said this before uh, a long time ago, but... I remember that the, that the fellow, you know, teenagers there that were, that were with me were saying how hard it was to pray and how difficult they found it to pray. And we can all relate to that. Sometimes it's hard to get into a good habit of prayer. And they were saying things like, you know, I just, I go through stuff and I've just got to like, you know, eke my way out and like get in the trenches and just kind of fight, fight the battle of prayer. It's hand-to-hand combat. It's hard. It's, it's tough. And, and I remember saying... I said, that's not what prayer is. Hand-to-hand combat, digging it out in the trenches, you and your knife and the enemy with his, and you're trying to, or with bayonets. That's not what, no, guys. That's you fighting in your own strength, a puny little switchblade trying to fight off the enemy. I was like, guys, prayer is calling in an airstrike from heaven. You're on the ground. You got nothing. You got no hope. You're losing. So what do you do? You get on the radio and you say, can you guys send some backup and bomb these guys? You call in an airstrike. And legions of heaven come and fight for you. God defends us. He fights for you. Prayer is you getting out of the way and saying, God, send them in. (laughs) And everybody's like, Wesley, you're so wise. You should be a preacher. (laughs) And that's how I got called to ministry. (laughs) Right? I mean, that's the power of Jesus. It's us getting out of the way and us calling in a name above which there is no other name. This is our motive and our grounds for hope. It's our grounds for trust, for confidence, for perseverance in prayer. To trust in the one who has all wisdom to know what is best and to work all things for our good in his time and his way on his terms. We just get out of the way and we bow and we trust. We trust in the name that is greater than every name. Jesus' name is all the greater because he has the power and authority over this life and he has the power and the authority over the life that is to come. The world, this world here and now, and the world that is to come. He has the power not just to help us in our circumstances, not just to get us through what we face, not just to bless and protect and guard and keep us, but he has the power to give us everlasting life. He has power over this life and the life to come. No one else has this power. And this is our second point. Point one is no other name is greater, but point two, no other name can save. And that's the next thing Peter and John get to in their response, in their trial. So if we look now at verses 11 and 12, they say, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name can save. Verse 12. 
But this verse 11 might be a bit odd and confusing. This stone rejected by the builders, God has made the cornerstone. That's obviously a metaphor, but where's that coming from? He's getting that from Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verse 22. And I want to read a bit of Psalm 118 to make the metaphor make a little more sense with a little bit of context. Psalm 118, 19. The the psalmist prays, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. There's the connection to 412 in Acts. No other name can save. I thank you, Psalm 118, 21. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, we always quote, this is the day the Lord has made, and we sing that song, this is the day, this is the day. Julie knows it. We, and we usually just apply it to every day of the week, right? This day is the day the Lord has made, and tomorrow it'll be the day the Lord has made, and Monday it'll be the day the Lord has made. And that's true. Of course that's true. But in context, what does Psalm 118, 24 mean? It means the day of Christ. This is the day the Lord has made when the stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. When Christ is rejected by the authorities and is crucified, and then God chooses to raise him up and say, no, 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 he's going to be the cornerstone. He's going to be the foundation stone, the most important stone. This is the day the Lord has made, the day of the Messiah, the day of Jesus. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success, the psalm continues. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus quotes that and the triumphal entry. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, I will give you thanks. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. That's how the psalm ends. So this is what he's referring to. This day, the day you have me on trial, the day I stand before you, this is the day the Lord has made. This is the day of salvation, the time when the promises and prophecies are fulfilled. Christ has been rejected by you guys that Peter's talking to, but God raised him up. And that's a fulfillment of Psalm 118, 22. The stone is rejected by the builders, the ones who were supposed to be building God's temple, rejected useless stone and God chooses that stone and says no I'm going to build my temple on this stone as the cornerstone what's he getting at with this metaphor God has made Jesus the Lord and Savior of the world and when you call upon that great name all his saving power is in your possession The one who is rejected by men is chosen by God and raised up as the foundation stone of salvation. And the whole edifice of salvation stands on this stone, on Christ. There is no other one who can save, and therefore there's no other name in which you can find salvation. But when you call upon his name, all of his saving power is in your possession. Power to forgive all your sins. Power to cleanse all of your unrighteousness. Power to wash you pure and innocent in his sight. Power to change your heart and make it beat with faith and love. Power to change the depths of your soul and make you a new creature that lives for the Lord, that runs to Him, that takes refuge in His name, not someone who rejects and runs away. When you call upon His name, you find all of His salvation that He accomplished. And who He is as Savior, 
he gives you to share in that salvation. And that's, in fact, why he's called Jesus, isn't it? In Matthew 121, the angel tells Joseph, you're going to name your son Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is Savior, and Jesus is Lord. So, Christian, do not look to any other name. Do not call on any other name. Do not begin to trust in any other name, especially not yours. Trust in the only name that can save. There is salvation in no one else, Peter says, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. At this point in Acts 4, the authorities respond to Peter and John. As you can imagine, they are not pleased. This is not the response they wanted. This is not how the trial they thought would go. <laughs> Look at verses 13 to 17. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. Peter and John didn't go to school. Uneducated here is unlettered. They're illiterate. They can't read. They can't write. They did not go to school. They didn't receive an education. They're fishermen. They grew up as fishermen. Common men, it says. This is derogatory. Oh, they're uneducated common men. They can't even read. But they're staggered that these men are quoting the Old Testament and they can't read? What? <laughs> How did they do that? Well, it says they were astonished in verse 13 and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I've always just felt such a shock of excitement go through me when I read a verse like that. Where I'm just like, man, I didn't have to go to seminary. <laughs> Nine years, and I should have read Acts 4.13. But then you wouldn't have hired me. <laughs> Because you can't get ordained in the EPC without, anyways. But I read a verse like this, and it depresses me at first. But then, then I get really excited because I'm, I think people can tell when you've been with Jesus. It's unmistakable. You can sit at the feet of Jesus and open the Gospels and get the best education that the disciples got. Just sit at his feet and drink it in and learn his word and watch him move and walk and talk and start to imitate that and live like that and be like that. People will see it doesn't matter what your education is, background is, skill set, how suave and cool and winsome you might be. They can see these guys have been with Jesus. She knows Jesus. Wow. She knows his word. She can quote it. She can pray it. She can teach it. She can explain it. She's incredible. Where did she get all this? She didn't go to school for nine years. She didn't have to. She just opened her Bible day after day and sat at Jesus' feet. And do that, Christian. Sit at his feet and be his student. That's what disciple means. Student, pupil, learner. Go to school. Every time you open your book, you're in class, right where you are. People will notice if you get with Jesus, he'll rub off on you. You'll look like him, talk like him, sound like him, love like him, forgive like him, be patient like him, give like him. You'll get conformed into this name. He won't just fix your problems when you pray. He won't just save you from your sin and take you to heaven. But he'll actually give you power to live like him and look like him and be like him. That's what being conformed to the image of Christ is all about. Spend that time with Jesus so that his name is obvious on your life. This is the response of these leaders to Peter and John. They could tell they'd been with Jesus. Verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. 
They couldn't argue with the miracle. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, so they told them to get out of the room, we've got to talk, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Everybody knows the guy was crippled and now he's healed. We can't argue with it. We can't discredit these guys. And we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. <clears throat> so, we can't deny a miracle was done, so let's make them shut up. Stop using that name. It's causing a lot of trouble. We can't deny it has power, because this guy's healed. But we can make you stop saying it. We can shut you up. We can tell you, speak no more in Jesus' name. Drop that name. Forget that name. Don't use that name or talk about that name in public anymore. Be Christians at home, but don't bring that out in the public square. Keep Jesus between your ears and deep in your heart, but shut up about that name. It's causing a lot of trouble. Be a private Christian. Don't be a public Christian. That's relevant for today. Because as things continue to change, and as politics, culture, society, economics, whatever, continues to go post-Christian, it will become increasingly more difficult to say the name of Jesus in public with this kind of boldness. This will not be something that happened 2,000 years ago. This could be something that's still in the future. Now, I'm not one of those doomsday guys who's like, oh, whoa, it's all over. Okay? Been much worse times in our world than this. You know, go live in the Middle Ages and get hacked to pieces with some guy with an axe <laughs> and it not be illegal. That, 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 it's better. It's better now <laughs> than it was in the Middle Ages. Okay? Right? And, that was, and those were all Christians. <laughs> in name, anyways. So I'm not saying it's the end of the world, but I'm saying that when push comes to shove, like it did here, and when you're forced to make a choice, and when it gets and when it gets more and more difficult, and you feel more and more pressure to be a silent Christian, a quiet Christian, especially on super sensitive social issues, just don't just just be quiet, stop being a, stop being so Christian, okay? Right? It's subtle. It's difficult. It calls for great, great boldness. And that's what Peter gives us in the last two verses of our passage, verses 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must be the judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Guys, we're sorry. We can't help being Christians. We believe in this name. You've seen the power of this name. There's no other name that's greater. There's no other name that can save. And there's no other name that's worthy. And that's the last point today. There is no other name that is worthy of our highest allegiance. No other name that's worthy of our obedience. No other name that's worthy to be sung and spoken and proclaimed and believed because there's hope in this name, there's life in this name, and of course the enemies of this name find it to be terribly bad news. And there's this great confrontation that's inevitable between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And you are in that fight, Christian. In small ways, in subtle ways, maybe in big ways, maybe in bigger ways in the future, we don't know. But we do know that the one who has all authority and whose kingdom cannot be shaken and cannot be stopped is the one who fights for us. And so we can speak up and speak boldly and stand up and stand out as an explicit, obvious Christian and just be Christian in public. When forced to choose, Jesus' name is more worthy of your obedience, more worthy than any other, including the authorities and the rulers. Whether it's right to listen to the authorities when they say, don't be a Christian, let them decide. For us, we can't help it. We will be Christians. We will follow Christ.
And in the next chapter, we don't have time to go there, but in the next chapter, in chapter 5, Peter and John repeat the same cycle. They start preaching. They get arrested. They're like, we told you to stop. <laughs> Didn't we? We just did this in the last chapter, fellas. Greatly annoyed. Greatly annoyed. And what we're told is, at the end of chapter 5, it says in verse 40, when they had called the apostles, they beat them. They beat them and charged them, demanded to them, passed a law, <laughs> do not speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. And verse 41 is amazing. Chapter 5, 41 in Acts. Then they, the, the, then they, the apostles, they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They rejoiced that they got beaten for the name of Jesus. It was a great honor to suffer for so great a name who suffered so greatly for us. And then verse 42, And every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. That's where we got to go to realize that no other name is worthy of our obedience and allegiance and no other name is worthy to be suffered for, to endure shame for. But his name is worthy. It's worth more than my comfort and convenience. Doesn't mean it's easy to suffer for the name, but it does mean it's possible to have the supernatural ability from the Lord to be like the Lord when he suffered who for the joy set before him endured even the cross. So Christian, worship this name. Trust this name. Call upon this name. Call on his name alone to save. Call on his name alone for the power that you need. Honor and obey his name above all others. Count it all joy and great honor and privilege to suffer for so great a name. May we all treasure the name of Jesus above all things, for there is no other name as wonderful and as worthy as his. Let's pray. Father, we immediately confess that we do not have it within us to be like this apart from your Holy Spirit doing a wondrous work in our hearts and lives. But we know that you have the power to do it. We know you have the plan to do it. And you call us to trust you and yield ourselves under your sovereign hand to be shaped and molded to be like Jesus. May we fully trust in the power of the name of Jesus as Christians in our daily lives and be quick to call upon that name in all things and to glorify that name in all things. May we trust in the name and power and work and person of Jesus alone as the only hope we have for our eternal salvation, that we look to nothing but to him and all that he has done in perfection for us. May we so trust in his name his name that alone can save. And may we see that name and treasure that name of Jesus more highly and treat it as more worthy than any other name we know so that we are willing to go against culture and pressure from society and friends and jobs and workplaces and in relationships and even from government and politics, no matter what the opposition is to your name, may we always side with your name. May we always stand up, stand out, step forward, and be bold Christians and wear that name openly, loudly, and proudly. May we glory in that name. And may we trust you that even if it brings difficulty and suffering of any kind in our lives, so work in our hearts that we count it joy and an honor and a privilege to endure reproach for so great a name because he endured it all for us. Oh, make us these people that we might treasure Jesus and the things of Christ above all else and look to no other name. We ask it in that name of Jesus. Amen.